OK, so I think I'll begin my uh, second of these four lectures. So this one I'm going to talk about how to compute in more detail the waves that are generated from a particular source. Uh, a few aspects of this process, I will defer to the lectures by Luciano Rezzola that come a little later this week. But I'll highlight some of the concepts that underlie the things that he will be talking about. So in particular, what I would like to do begin is to show how the quadrupole formula for gravitational waves arise from the Einstein field equations. So I'm going to begin by sort of beginning with take the exact Einstein field equations, take the Einstein tensor that characterizes a space time, which is then equated to the source, the stress energy tensor, show how this turns into a wave equation for the perturbation to the space time metric. Um, and uh, characterize solutions to this. And then that really only works uh, in a certain approximation. I want to highlight what the nature of that approximation is and how one iterates to go beyond the, the limitations of that approximation and eventually solves the field equations exactly. Uh, a particularly important thing to do when I go through this is I want to emphasize sort of important gauge invariant aspects that describe radiation. Just as in electricity and magnetism, we can choose a particular gauge which uh, tells us about the properties of our potentials. The same thing, in the same way, we can choose gauges which characterize the properties of the, the space-time metric, but that might just be artifacts of the coordinates and have nothing to do with the radiation that detectors can actually measure. So. <clears throat> I'm going to begin by, once again, we're going to work, we're going to start with this weak field expansion. So what I'm going to do is use the idea that space time is similar to that of flat space time plus a little bit else. And I'm going to then work through the tensors that describe general relativity, sort of ruthlessly discarding all terms that look like h squared or higher. And so this is. I'll be blunt. I'm not going to go through this in detail. There's just a tremendous amount of garbage you need to sort of sift through for this. And uh, you know, make yourself a nice pot of tea, sit down with a sharp pencil, and you know, have a blast. Uh, it's a textbook demonstration of the principle, straightforward but tedious. Uh, the one thing which I will just say is there is one trick. So if you when you uh, if you use this as your space time tens as your space time metric and then linearize, you'll find that your Einstein tensor turns into this uh, rather horrible mess, where there's some definitions of these things here. To clean this up, we use a trick. So if rather than using this h mu nu, which is actually the perturbation of space time that we directly measure, we use sort of an analogous object, which is h mu nu with this quantity subtracted off of it. So this h here is the trace of the space-time perturbation. This is defined such that the trace of the barred metric is the minus the trace of the metric itself. Okay? It's nothing more than a notational trick. But if you rewrite this horrible mess using h bar rather than h, you find that all the terms that involve the trace, so this term in particular and this term, they go away. So it's just a way to get rid of two of these six horrible terms. And if you look at the remaining four terms that are left, one of them is a wave operator. And the other three are terms that look like divergences of this tensor. Okay, So this one, exchange the order of the derivatives. It's the divergence on the gamma index of h bar. This one, uh, again, exchange the, these, these derivatives. It's divergence on the gamma index uh, over here. And this one, again, exchange the order, divergence on the gamma index. So what we can do is, in the same way that we were able to shift potential in electrodynamics, in linearized general relativity, you can introduce an infinitesimal coordinate transformation. So imagine you are starting your analysis in some coordinate system x alpha. And you change all of your coordinates by a little generator, c alpha. That will change the metric as long as c alpha is small, in the sense that if I take the derivative of c and square it, it's infinitesimal. That changes your metric to a form that looks like this. And what's wonderful about this is that after you have changed your coordinates like so, okay, you've changed your metric. But the Riemann curvature that arises from this thing, so all the r's that follow from your metric, they remain unchanged. 
So it really is just like a gauge transformation in electrodynamics in the same way that changing the potential has no effect on electric and magnetic fields. Changing my coordinates affects my metric, which is kind of like a potential, but leaves no impact on the curvature. So what we do is we change. Uh, so it turns out that when you do this, the trace reverse one, you get a very similar kind of form. And so what we do is we choose to work in a coordinate system such that the divergence of the trace reverse perturbation is zero. Okay? This is actually called Lorentz gauge. It looks just like the Lorentz gauge that one uses in electrodynamics as far as the mathematics are concerned. And when we do that, go back two slides here, three slides, this horrible mess for the Einstein tensor turns into this single term. The wonders of a smart choice of coordinates. And so when you do that, then your Einstein field equations are just wave operator on this trace reverse tensor is up to a coupling coefficient, the stress energy tensor. And remember, we've already solved this equation. Okay? Like I said, we did it the way any smart physicist would do it. We looked it up in a book. So we go and we look it up in a book again, remind ourselves what the structure is. Uh, using the electromagnetic, uh, the, excuse me, the radiative Green's function, we can write down the solution to this and just say, ta-da, my, uh, my solution for my, uh, given a particular source, which has a stress energy tensor given by this team you knew, here is the perturbation to space time that arises from this. So you give me a team you knew, Lock me in a closet with a pot of tea and a sharp pencil, and I will come out an hour or two later with the H mu nu that characterizes this. That's all you need to do. We need to be a little bit careful, though. When we do this, so remember, I wrote this down in a particular coordinate system. I chose a particular gauge. And it's very important that we understand whether our gauge clearly allows us to understand what bits of this H mu nu correspond to radiation and which do not. Let me illustrate this by an analogy. Suppose I gave you the following vector potential. Okay, so it's of a form where the time-like component and all the spatial components uh, have these oscillatory forms that involve a cosine of kz minus omega t in it. If I sort of gave this to you and said, what does this correspond to? You've got five seconds. Well, any reasonable person would first say, why are you asking me this? But <laughs> once you thought about it for a second, you would see all these oscillations and you would think, this kind of looks like a plane wave propagating in the z direction. So then I say, OK, you've got 10 minutes. Work out the fields. And when you do that, what you find is a Coulomb point charge sitting at the origin. In order to generate that, what I actually did was I worked backwards. I started with the Coulomb uh, potential, and then I put it into a really stupid gauge. Okay? That just, just wanted to show that you know, one can get a gauge. It, when you look at things from the perspective of the potential, it can be very misleading. A potential that looks radiative might, in fact, actually be perfectly static. And so the, the lesson of this little parable as it applies to gravitational radiation is that we need to be careful when we are given some h mu nu that you understand what is the actual radiative degrees of freedom in that metric and which are just things that might be gauge or might correspond to some other physical phenomenon. It turns out there actually is a theorem uh, that helps us to understand this. And, um, I'm personally fond of a proof that I worked out with my colleague Anna, Anna Flanagan, uh, which you can find on the archive. It's now, I'm embarrassed to note, 14 years old. It's actually been used in a textbook recently. If I give you some metric perturbation and I tell you what time coordinate I'm using, that's an important thing. We'll come back to the meaning of different time coordinates a little bit later in this lecture. Then it turns out that only the spatial transverse traceless components of that h mu nu describe radiation in a gauge invariant manner. Okay? You might find that bits that correspond to the trace of this tensor and bits that are not perfectly spatial, it might be one component is time and the others are space, or it might be time time, they might be wiggly. right? They might have a sinusoidal dependence to them, but they are not radiation in a gauge invariant manner. And so what exactly I mean by this? So for this thing to be transverse, so first of all, HIJTT, so it's, this is the spatial pieces, are the HIJ, so only the components where the, uh, the, the indices are not the time coordinate. 
and I require that it be div spatially divergence free. That's what's meant by transverse. And I will show exactly why that's transverse a few slides from now. And I require that it be spatially traceless. The bits of HIJ that satisfy these requirements, they characterize the radiation in your space time in a gauge invariant manner. This is great because it means that you know, again, lock me in a closet, give me your favorite stress energy tensor, lock me in a closet, I will churn out H mu nu, and then if I want to know what the radiation content of that is, all I need to do is pick out the piece of it that satisfies these constraints, boom, that's gravitational radiation. So how do I actually use this? So let's begin by focusing on the spatial components of the trace reverse metric perturbation. So I wrote down a solution to the wave equation a few slides ago, where these ij's became mu nu. Let's just focus on the spatial piece of this. I'm going to assume that the source is compact compared to this, the distance at which I'm making my measurements. So what that means is I can simplify these uh, x minus x prime magnitudes and approximate this like so. So now, I use the fact that the stress energy tensor in general relativity satisfies a conservation law. In linearized theory, that boils down to a statement that the divergence of this thing is equal to zero. I can break this up into a time and a space bit, and uh, also sort of a time, a t let's see, a time time and a time space bit, and then a time space and a space space bit. So these two equations break down with this particular choice of time coordinate what this conservation law means. I can combine them into a form that looks like so. Reason I'm doing all this is that I can, by essentially just sitting down and with a little bit of sort of algebraic gymnastics and you know, basically by being stubborn, it's not difficult to prove that if I take this guy, multiply by ix, ij, I get something that involves tij. The reason I'm doing this is that tij is the quantity that appears under my integral. And what I want to do is put this into a form where I can get a more useful formulation of this integral out. So what I'm going to do is rearrange this big mess here in terms of this. So when I substitute this under here, my uh, original integral, I get one bit here. Notice what this looks like. I've got xi, xj times two spatial derivatives of my source. Uh, over here, I've got terms that look like divergences of something. They can be taken to be uh, surface integrals. Okay, and so when I do them, I can take the surface outside of my source. They contribute nothing to this integral. So what I'm left with is just this one expression that involves two, essentially, moments of this double divergence of the stress energy tensor. But remember, that double divergence of the stress energy tensor, by the conservation law, can be turned into two time derivatives of the TT piece of that. Now, the TT piece of a stress energy tensor is just the matter energy density. So what this all tells me is that if I go back to my original formula here, do all this little bit of gymnastics, and I get a new formula that tells me that my trace reverse metric perturbation is two time derivatives of the following integral over the mass and energy density. This is a more rigorous version of the calculation that I sketched for you in sort of order of magnitude form in the first calculation, excuse me, in the first lecture, where I showed that the leading radiation, it has a form that involves integrals of this bit and looks like two time derivatives with a one over r multiplying it. So I want you to compare. So this thing I have, my, my leading radiation, my, my leading solution for this thing, two time derivatives of two moments of the distribution of mass and energy, compared to the dipole formula where it's one time derivative of a single moment of the charge distribution. Very, very similar form. Okay? Uh, the main difference is that when I go to general relativity, I need to look at the next moment up, so to speak, because the lower moments, as I described last time, are protected by conservation laws. And as such, I need to take another time derivative.
All right, so this is great. I've now got a solution for this guy, but I have to identify the transverse and traceless pieces of it in order to identify what bit of it is actually radiation. And so the way I do that is sort of the same trick I used in the previous lecture. I'm going to expand this thing in Fourier modes. So in particular, I'm going to expand it in plane waves like so. I'm going to sort of imagine that my hij can be written as some integral over a, a vector wave number. There'll be an amplitude that only depends on the wave number, and uh, then a, a Fourier mode form. The requirement that it be transverse is a statement that this thing's divergence vanish. Well, when I apply the divergence to this, I just pull down a factor of the wave vector. And so this is a statement that the wave vector dotted into my amplitude tensor be 0. Okay, so this thing has to be orthogonal to the direction of propagation, is what that's saying. <clears throat> so we can enforce that by introducing a couple of definitions. So let's define a direction vector, n hat, to be the magnitude of the wave vector. If I do this, then this tensor P will pick out components of any tensor that is orthogonal to n. So once I've done that, I've now defined a transverse wave field. And I remind you that the, the actual physical wave is not only transverse, so I've, I've projected it twice because I need to pick out both of my indices. Uh, I then need to remove the trace. And just a little bit of algebra, I take the trace of this guy. And that ends up pulling off a factor that looks like this right here. Ta-da! This is now a component. This is now an object that is transverse and traceless. Now at this point, there's really no distinction between the trace reverse field and the original. So it's just kind of annoying to have that extra over bar on top of everything. So in what follows, I'm going to drop it. This is the field that characterizes at leading order the gravitational radiation that arises from a given source. When you go into a general relativity textbook and you look up the quadrupole formula, this is what is meant by that, at least if the book is being rigorous. Sometimes they're not being so rigorous and they might just report this. But you need to include these projection tensors, which describe the way it varies depending on propagation direction to fully understand the radiative degrees of freedom in this uh, metric. All right, so let's apply this. Probably the most important example of a gravitational wave source, um, certainly it's the one that's been measured and on which some of us have built our careers, uh, is the gravitational waves that arise from a binary system. So <clears throat> we'll do the lowest order solution describing a binary. So imagine I've got two masses, m1 and m2, that orbit each other like so. I'm going to imagine that they are in a circular orbit and they're separated by a distance r. So uh, you go and remember part of what went into this is this formula for the quadrupole moment of the source. So let's just imagine that these masses, that the, the stars are very small compared to their separation. Doing that, uh, it's not terribly difficult to show that the stress energy, excuse me, the quadrupole moment arising from them, just a little bit of algebra, apply that integral to this source, and you get this form that looks like so. Uh, where I've introduced the reduced mass of the system, something I hope you're all familiar with. And what I'm going to do at this level of approximation is I'm going to treat the orbit as simply Keplerian. So I'm going to ignore for the moment the fact that we know Newton is wrong to get at least the short time scale orbital dynamics of these things. So I'm imagining that Newton's gravity works well enough to describe the orbit on short time scales. Okay, I'm going to ask, okay, given that, what gravitational waves will result from this? Okay, so I've got my quadrupole moment. I take two time derivatives of this. And what I'm going to do is imagine an observer who is sitting on the binary symmetry axis. So imagine that I have an observer who is sort of sitting up here on the ceiling looking at this, and they're measuring the gravitational waves that come from that. So I then evaluated two time derivatives of this thing. I worked out the uh, projection tensor for an observer sitting right here at the origin. And here is the gravitational wave field that resulted from that. Notice, so I am defining my, my coordinates. So let's say this is an x coordinate, this is the y coordinate, this is the z coordinate. There's nothing along the direction of propagation. Traceless, I'm excuse me, transverse, exactly like it's supposed to be. 
Also note that if I sum on the diagonal, zero. That's traceless. So sanity check. I didn't mess up. <laughs> um, the other thing which is nice is that when you go through and you do these calculations, you can see that the gravitational field, it oscillates twice for every period of orbit of the source. That's due to the quadrupole nature of the radiation itself. Okay, and that follows in a straightforward way from the fact that you know, I can rewrite my cosine squared as cosine of 2 omega plus a constant. My sine times cosine is sine of 2 omega up to a factor of order unity. And so that's how I end up with this uh, nice quadrupole result. Now, um, I haven't, it turned out there was no trace in this one, but sometimes when you do these kind of calculations, it's useful to sort of remove the trace from the beginning. And I put this slide in here because often when you are reading general relativity textbooks, the quadrupole moment that one uses in the calculation has a form that looks like this instead. What's going on here is that um, you will often see people use a variant of the quadrupole moment tensor in which the trace has been removed in step one. Okay? That's fine. This, ends up be, this sort of ends up commuting with those different projection tensors. But when you look up in various textbooks, you'll sort of say, hey, Professor Hughes didn't have this one-third R uh, delta uh, appearing in there. It's a bit of a choice whether you do that in step one or a little bit later in the calculation. Uh, but you often see things, like I said, written in terms of this so-called irreducible quadrupole moment. Okay? All right, well, let's now again estimate what the magnitude of this effect is. So I did an order of magnitude one based on my approximate formulas in lecture one. Let's use this less approximate formula now. So if I go and let me go back to my waveform. So the magnitude of this thing is it looks like G times reduced mass, frequency squared, separation of the binary, and then other factors of numbers, speed of light, and distances. Um, I've written it in this form because this is a dimensionless number and this is a dimensionless number. So omega times r is essentially the orbital speed. So this is orbital speed squared divided by the speed of light. g mu over r is something like the gravitational potential related to the reduced mass of the source felt at a distance r. So Make a couple of definite, you know, just basically exploit the fact that I'm using Kepler's laws. And what you find, so what I'm going to do is plug in for the separation, and I'm going to replace that with orbital frequency. This whole thing can be rewritten in terms of a particular combination of the masses of the binary. So if I take reduced mass to the 3 fifths, total mass to the 2 fifths, this formula for the strain arising from this binary only involves this particular combination of the masses, the individual members of the binary. This combination, this sort of script M here, is known as the chirp mass. Okay, in a few slides, I'm going to show that this controls the rate at which the frequency changes. Okay, it's the mass that determines how quickly the binary chirps. Anyway, with all of this sort of under control, it's now not that difficult to turn this into a new, a new set of numbers. So let's just sort of assume we have two masses that are equal to one another, and I'm going to use the fact that the gravitational wave frequency, not the omega, but the frequency that's measured in a detector like LIGO, is twice the orbital frequency divided by 2 pi. And here we can see a bit more rigorously, if I have a source at 500 megaparsecs, total mass, each individual mass is 20 solar masses, the strain is 6 times 10 to the minus 22 at a frequency of 100 hertz. I chose these numbers because this is very much in line with the sources that are being measured by detectors today. Now, I worked this out specifically for an observer who is sitting immediately above that source. Okay? That particular observer actually sees two polarizations of the waveform, okay, which corresponds to all the different, if you look at that, let me go back for just a second, and look at the, uh, the gravitational wave tensor that um, we worked out. Yeah. So this tensor has uh, four independent, it has four components, but two of them are trivially related to one another. There are two that are unique. 
these correspond to different polarization states. Um, and in fact, when you analyze, and I will do this in my third lecture, when one analyzes the way these two polarization states interact with the detector, you find they have independent effects. Okay? Uh, the plus one tends to exert lines of force on uh, a set of axes. You might define some preferred axes, and it'll tend to sort of act on those. This will tend to act on lines of force that are oriented 45 degrees, rotated from the ones that the plus polarization works on. So this is uh, an important sort of aspect of the way in which these two polarizations encode different information about the source. And we're going to come back to that in some of the later lectures where we talk about the way in which the measurements encode astronomical information about these sources. Um, as I said, I set this thing up imagining a source that is directly above the observer. Excuse me, yeah, a source that's directly above the observer. That never happens. Okay? Uh, in reality, these things are randomly distributed on the sky, and they have random orientations. Uh, the binaries tend to be sort of independently and completely randomly distributed in how the, the normal to their orbital planes are oriented. And so let me just tell you, walk you through a little bit of the geometry of how one gets the field for a more general orientation of sources. So the key thing you need to do this is can all be done in a very nice geometric way. So let's define a vector L, which is normal to the plane of the binary. So if I had to think sitting in the sky here, I just use right-hand rule, put my fingers in the direction that the orbit is going. And L is the normal to the plane of the binary. My detector is on the surface of the Earth right here. N is the vector that points from the axis of my detector to this binary. Now, I'm going to define two unit vectors, P and Q, that are both normal to that N. I'm going to choose P such that it points along the major axis of the ellipse defining that binary as I see it on the sky. So if you sort of imagine. Can I borrow your plate for just a moment? You have the saucer? No, I'm sorry. That's OK. Thank you. <laughs> Demos. <laughs> so you know, if I imagine the binary is on the sky such that the L is directly normal to the line of sight, I see a circle. But in general, I'm going to see it tilted in some way. Okay? It's going to have some kind of an orientation like this. And projected onto the sky, what I'm going to see is an ellipse. So I'm going to define the vector p to be along the major axis of that ellipse. And then I will define q to be something that's orthogonal to both n and p. Okay, So I've defined this, this quartet of unit vectors. And then it doesn't take a lot of work, but it does take a bit, and it's somewhat tedious. It's not terribly difficult to show that your radiation field can, in this general framework, be written in the following way. I have a plus polarization and a cross polarization. And I use those P's and Q's to define a set of basis polarization tensors. Once I've done that, this is the way my waveform looks. My two amplitudes are related to the overlap between the line of sight to the binary and uh, the normal to the orbital plane. And so let me borrow the saucer again. So if I imagine that I have a binary that I'm looking at in the sky, and it just so happens that the normal to that, orb that binary's plane is along my line of sight, then L dot n is 1. And the amplitude of my h plus, this 1 plus 1 squared turns into a 2. There's a factor of 4 that appears here. L dot n is 1, and I get a 4 here. As this thing tilts away from directly being along the line of sight, let's say I catch it directly edge on, L dot n is 0, I get no cross polarization, and I get half as much plus polarization. Okay? So by independently measuring, if I can independently measure these two polarizations, I've immediately learned something important about the geometry of this source. How well I can actually measure those two things depends upon what the polarization tensors are. And that, in turn, depends upon where this thing is located in the sky relative to my detectors. So everything that I have done so far 
I have imagined that I have a binary that's just sitting there in a circle, orbiting and orbiting and orbiting and never changing. That's wrong. I talked in the last lecture about the fact that radiation is going to carry energy away from the system. It actually takes away energy and angular momentum. That will back react on the system. It will cause the members to fall towards one another. So the issue here is I need to go beyond this first order calculation I've given you and understand how the wave back reacts to affect the binary. And we know, at least heuristically, that we should find an effect that scales as something like h squared, or the derivative of h squared. So let's try to make this a little bit more rigorous. I emphasized in the last lecture that there's a challenge here. There's a fundamental theoretical challenge, which is that in general relativity, the principle of equivalence demands I cannot make a sensible global notion of energy associated with the gravitational field. Excuse me, I cannot make a sensible local notion of energy associated with the gravitational field. I can always perform a gauge transformation such that at this exact point in space and time, space time is flat, its time derivative is zero, and there's no energy associated with it. Okay? But that is only true in a very small location. So I need to sort of build in the fact that um, I don't want to do that if I want to measure the energy content associated with what is being radiated by this binary. Now this means that I cannot make a unique formulation for the local, for the flux of energy and angular momentum in gravitational waves. I have to actually make some choices. And you know what? That's fine. <laughs> People often get really hung up on the fact that you know, sometimes you just cannot make a gauge invariant statement. Nonetheless, sometimes you use a gauge dependent statement for part of your calculation and get a gauge invariant result at the end of the day once you do your analysis properly. It's no big deal. So there are two ways that we can do this to analyze our binary. One is we pick a particular coordinate system, a particular formulation of the field equations, and within the context of that formulation, we can define a notion of gravitational wave energy. We balance that against some definition of the binary's energy. You require that there be an overall conservation principle, and this will allow us to allow our binary to evolve. Another way to do this is you can define in a more rigorous way a, a, a notion in which one builds in the fact that gravitational radiation is a non-local phenomenon, that it sort of extends over a large region, and use that to average away. You know, I, as I emphasized, I can make gravity go away at my one location here, but I can't do that for everyone. Okay? I can make gravity go away for me, but not for you. And so we can use that to define uh, a quantity that makes sense, provided I go beyond a local region of space-time. So the approach one, where you just introduce a particular formulation of this thing, beautiful, uh, the people who did this in probably the most useful way and is used throughout the literature was uh, Landau and Lifshitz. <clears throat> if you know Landau's work, <laughs> it's pretty smart. So it's not too surprising it held up. Uh, it involves a little bit of ugly notation, but that's all right. So they introduced a way of rewriting the Einstein field equations that absolutely exact, and it's well suited to constructing an iterative solution to the field equations. It also gives a useful notion of a flux of energy and momentum carried by uh, gravity. So we have to begin by defining this sort of Gothic metric, which is a densitized version of the space-time metric. You take your space-time metric and you multiply it by square root of the negative determinant. From this, you can construct this auxiliary field, capital H. And then this is a bit of a miracle, but it turns out that the exact Einstein field equations are simply given by two derivatives of this capital H field, and they relate to the source like so. This is a little bit of a swindle, because what I've actually done here is I've introduced a new field, this lowercase t alpha beta, LL stands for Landau and Lifshitz, that is itself actually a complicated expression that's actually quadratic in this, this G up here. So you know, I've, what I've essentially done is I've taken all the complications and I've swept it into a definition. That's what theorists do. There's really good discussion of this in a recent textbook that was written by uh, Eric Poisson and Cliff Will, which I highly recommend. Conceptually, though, the key thing which we need to know is that within this formulation, the idea that your stress energy tensor is conserved turns into a statement that this right-hand side of the field equations is divergence-free. 
Once we've done that, that allows us to define a sensible notion of a flux of quantities of, of energetics. And in particular, in the landau lifshitz formulation, this contains all notions of energy momentum bound up in matter sources. This contains all notions of energy and, and momentum bound up in gravitational fields. Let's move on to the other approach. And this was developed by uh, Richard Isaacson in the late 1960s. So the idea here is you can make a tensor that describes the energy content of gravitational radiation, something that is fully covariant, has, uh, covariant, has all the nice properties that a tensor has in general relativity. But it has to be, it's not a quantity that is defined at a local point, really. You have to take this quantity that you construct here and average it over an intermediate length scale, where by intermediate, I mean I average this over a scale that is somewhere between the wavelength of the radiation and the scale associated with the gravitational field of all of your backgrounds. Okay, so there's, a, there's sort of a, a, uh, a two length scale approximation that's been introduced here. Once you do that, then it will turn out that this satisfies the usual conservation rule, and you can use this quantity to define a sensible notion of a flux of gravitational radiation. Um, in practice, so one could imagine using this to compute corrections of the space time, and in fact, one does this, at least for circular binaries. It has turned out over the years, so both these techniques have been in the literature now for decades, this is in some ways uh, attractive for pedagogical purposes, but it's not as practical to actually implement. Uh, Lando and Lifshitz has really proven to be the technique that people use to do these things um, in the real world. Well, however you do it, you apply both of them, and it turns out that the amount of energy that flows out of my binary is given by the following formula, which involves three time derivatives of that reduced quadrupole moment. So it's really just a matter of somewhat tedious algebra and a little bit of time locked in a closet with a sharp pencil uh, to pull this out of formulas like that. Now, if I use the uh, quadrupole moment that corresponded to my circular binary system, that tells me that at some instant, the energy flowing out of this thing is related to the reduced mass of the system, the separation of the binary, and the orbital frequency, like so. Um, I'm going to require that energy be globally conserved. And so what I'm going to do is imagine that this energy that is being radiated away from the system is balanced by a rate of change of the energy associated with the orbit. For now, I will just use Newtonian gravity to define what the orbital energy is. And uh, if I have two objects orbiting one another um, in a circular orbit, I add up the kinetic and potential energy associated with their orbital motions, and I get minus g mu m over 2r is the total energy of the system. Great. So now, my binary has two members with masses m1 and m2. Capital M is the total mass. Mu is the reduced mass. <clears throat> by enforcing this balance between the two of them, that tells me that the orbital radius must shrink. So if I differentiate this, now the masses aren't going to change. The only thing that can change in this formula is the radius. So in order for this, this thing's derivative to match the, uh, the amount of radiation carried by gravitational waves, the radius has to get smaller with time. If the radiation is getting smaller with time, then the frequency is getting larger with time. And when you trace through all the algebra, what you find is the rate of change of the frequency is simply related to, here's our friend the chirp mass again, up to a numerical factor. It's the chirp mass times omega to the 11 thirds. So this is telling me that a given, if I have a binary with a frequency omega, at that moment, the frequency will be changing at a rate that goes as the omega to the 11 thirds. Notice how steep that is. That's basically telling me that, you know, as let's say I go from 100 hertz to 200 hertz, the frequency has doubled, and so the rate of change of frequency has gone up by a factor of 2 to the 11 thirds, which is something like a factor of 14 or 15. So as this thing gets closer and closer, and as the frequencies get higher and higher, 
the rate of increase gets faster and faster and faster. And the only dimensionful quantity that relates it to them is this factor that involves the mass of the system, the so-called chart mass. And notice, when you take a mass and you multiply by g and divide by c cubed, it becomes a time. So you often see this called a chirp time that characterizes the system. <clears throat> so if you integrate up this d omega dt, you get a simple law that characterizes the way in which the uh, orbital frequency of the system behaves as a function of time. This is the leading order solution describing the evolution of a binary in general relativity due to gravitational wave emission. Um, so here is my summary. If you want to know the leading solution describing the behavior of binary systems in general relativity under gravitational radiation, it's all in this slide. <laughs> okay, so these will all be posted. I'll just leave this up for your enjoyment. Now, I described a binary that is circular. I described a binary in which I only looked at the leading radiative multiple moment, and I treated the bodies as though they were point masses in doing this calculation. None of those conditions is actually true. Okay? Every binary that we look at in the universe has modifications that go beyond this. Let's look first at what happens when you go beyond circular. So I'm going to leave the other conditions the same. I'm just going to look at uh, the, the leading gravity, the leading radiative multiple. I'll continue to treat them as point masses. But I'm going to imagine it's got some eccentricity. Well, when that's the case, then it's not just the system is not just characterized by its orbital energy. The orbital angular momentum and the energy are each, in a separate way, related to the system's geometry, in particular to its semi-major axis and to its eccentricity. When I go through the exercise of solving the quadrupole formula for the radiation, what I find is that the energy and the angular momentum, their evolution relates to the system's parameters in a rather more complicated way. Okay? So if, in particular, what you find is this sort of very interesting enhancement effect due to the eccentricity of the system. Um, <clears throat> What one finds, you can take these formulas for DEDT and DLDT, you can connect it to the definitions of the orbital energy and the orbital angular momentum, and you can use this to find the rate at which the semi-major axis and the eccentricity change. And the key thing which I want to emphasize here is that we find, once again, the orbits shrink. That makes sense. It's carrying energy away. They're falling towards one another. But perhaps more interestingly, they tend to circularize. So if you start out with a binary that is eccentric, gravitational radiation will tend to drive it into a circular configuration. At least leading order, this is the case. And when it iterates to higher order, one finds it is still roughly the case, but the rate of circularization eventually starts to slow down a little bit. And so it's a really interesting question. As we begin measuring more and more binaries in gravitational waves, do they have eccentricity or not? So far, all the cases we have found are consistent with them being perfectly circular. And then it turns into an experimental question. How big does the uh, eccentricity have to be before we can ascertain it on the waveform? Um, let's go beyond Newtonian gravity. So I treated this binary as though Kepler's laws and Newton's gravity described its small time uh, dynamics. If I use that Landau and Lifshitz formulation of general relativity, that gives me a scheme that allows me to iterate. It, it includes the Newtonian limits, and it gives me a very natural scheme for iterating to include additional corrections beyond Newtonian gravity. So what I'm going to show you is the acceleration law that one gets using that formalism, which tells me how m1 moves due to the gravitational attraction to m2. And so you find, like I said, in, at leading order, Newtonian gravity comes out of this. I iterate, and I get some corrections to this. Some very interesting facets of this correction is that you find that the acceleration of m1 depends on m1. This is actually a self-gravity effect. Okay? A very similar effect arises in electrodynamics when you accelerate a charge. It's the self-force that acts on an accelerating electron. In this case, we're getting a self-force arising from the acceleration of a mass. Okay? So that's great. We see what the correction is. You know, the thing is, though, this procedure just defines a crank, which you can turn. And you can keep turning. <laughs> um, this paper, which I excluded this for, is now 13 years old. There's an additional several orders that have been worked out. <laughs> uh, I know, my point has been made. 
Um, there's additional things that happen. So we have been treating these masses as though they were point masses. They're not. Okay, if nothing else, they, we know that every macroscopic body in the universe has angular momentum associated with it. That is particularly important in general relativity. You may recall in my first lecture, I described the way we expect there to be sort of both electric and magnetic type of contributions to the, uh, the gravitational, to, to the space time, the gravitational potential. And in fact, the gravitational force in relativity has a kind of both an electric and a magnetic character associated with it. So because mass currents interact with gravity in a unique way, a spinning body is essentially a body that has strong internal mass currents. What we find, so let's imagine that those currents arise from a body's angular momentum. It's a body spinning on its axis. The spin of body one processes due to the way S1 interacts with the angular momentum of the binary and due to its interaction with the angular momentum, the spin angular momentum of the other body. So what's kind of interesting is that this has exactly the form that one sees for the precession of a magnetic dipole sitting in an external magnetic field. You can think of this as a gravitomagnetic field that arises from the orbit of the binary. And this is a gravitomagnetic field arising from the other body's spin. This leads to new forces that modify the orbital acceleration due to each body. But it's also the case that on short time frames, there must be a notion of angular momentum that is globally conserved. And so what we find is that if you define a total angular momentum, which is the orbital angular momentum plus the individual spins, as S1 and S2 wiggle around according to these equations, L is going to wiggle around in such a way as to preserve this sum, compensating for the precession of the individual spins. This is a little hard to visualize, so let me just show you a little movie of this. Let me show you what you're going to see. Over on the right here, I'm showing you two objects that are, uh, so this, both these frames show two objects in orbit around one, uh, each other. Over on the right, these orange bars show the directions associated with the spin of the bodies that are in this orbit. Over here on the left, you're going to see these uh, blue streaks. Those correspond to the orbital motions of the bodies themselves. And this magenta rod that's sticking out of that, that's the normal to the orbital plane. Over here on the right, you again have that magenta rod, which is showing in sort of a different coordinate system that normal to the orbital plane. The green rod shows the direction associated with their sum. So as I let this binary evolve, what we see is that the two individual spins process, the orbital pl plane processes, but they do so in such a way as to leave the direction absolutely constant. Now this has very strong implications for the gravitational waveforms that we measure. Suppose I generate gravitational waves from two binaries that are from a binary whose members are non-spinning. I described to you before how it carries energy away from the system. As it carries energy away from the system, they fall towards one another and the frequency gets higher. That leads to this characteristic chirp form. So as they move faster, the amplitude gets higher, and you can see that the frequency associated with these waves is getting higher and higher. It's great to say in words. Um, this is a unique spectral characteristic, however. And it turns out every human being is equipped with fantastic spectral discriminators hooked up to an amazing pattern recognition system. That's called your ears, and the pattern recognition system is your brain. So what I've done is I've taken this gravitational waveform, and I've encoded it as a sound so that we can hear what the chirp of this thing sounds like. So that is that d omega goes as omega to the 11 thirds. That is what you are hearing uh, as this inspire of these objects proceeded. In this example, I imagine that these two black, the, the members of the binary were non-spinning black holes. Now imagine I make them rapidly spinning. Remember when we did this, uh, we showed that as these objects process, the orbital plane oscillates to sort of compensate for the processions of the members of the binaries. Remember also that the polarization depends upon the overlap between the normal to the, uh, to the orbital plane and your line of sight. So if the normal to the orbital plane is oscillating, 
the amplitude of the polarization that your detector measures is going to oscillate as well. And that shows up in this modulation that we see here in the waveform. More interestingly, although it was a little difficult to see in the formulas I showed, there is an oscillation in the gravitational attraction between the two of them. For intuition, think about what happens when you have bar magnets that are near one another. Okay, so two spins are kind of like magnetic dipole moments, but in a gravitational analog. And so you can sort of imagine that if their spins are, if you have two magnetic dipole moments and they're sort of oscillating and processing around, the instantaneous force between the two of them is oscillating as well. When I encode this as a gravitational wave, here's what we hear. Hopefully you all heard the sort of associated with that. So that's that same overall chart pattern, but now with a modulation imposed on it, which is due to the, these different modulations that arise from the interactions of spin with gravity. Um, everything I've described to you so far, and I will wrap up in the next about six or so minutes, is based on the idea that I have some kind of a small parameter, orbital speed, um, you know, some, something like that, that I can use to define an iterative uh, procedure for solving the Einstein field equations. That does not work in the last moments of some of the most interesting sources that are being measured today. So what we must do in general is we need a scheme for just directly solving for the Einstein field equations. So the goal of people for many years was to say, okay, imagine I can describe a binary at some initial moment in time. Okay, perhaps it's something that came out of one of these approximative schemes that have been developed. And then what I want to do is take that initial data and integrate forward in time. I want to put it into a computer system and evolve how these objects come together, uh, evolve and produce gravitational radiation. There's a problem here. And it's associated with the words initial data and integrate forward in time. The Einstein field equations do not have a built-in notion of time. So if I define initial and I define forward in time, that is a statement that depends deeply on how I have chosen to take space-time, the geometric object that general relativity is based on, and break it up into space and time. So basically what you need to do in order to solve these things exactly in the manner that I described is you imagine space-time as some uh, uh, okay, I've suppressed the dimension here, but let's say time goes to the future and each one of these, uh, you can sort of go through this thing. You need to slice it into moments of different times according to a particular choice that you make. And I want you to imagine that every one of these slices actually corresponds to some three-dimensional geometry for essentially the entire universe. So we need to reformulate the field equations to describe how this geometry evolves from moment to moment once I have actually done this. And I believe you're going to hear a lot more about this in Luciano de Zola's lectures um, later this week. <clears throat> I will just sort of comment that you know, when you do this, there's again a nice analogy that can be made to the Maxwell field equations. So um, when you break up the Einstein equations, which are 10 uh, components for the, uh, the Einstein field equations, you find that four of them are what are called constraints, which tell us how the space-time geometry at every moment how it is constrained, how the, how the different uh, pieces of the space-time relate to each other on that moment of time. And these play a role that are similar to the divergence equations in Maxwell's theory. Uh, the other six equations are what we call evolution equations, which tell us how one steps from moment to moment in much the same way that you can rearrange the curl equations as equations for the time derivatives of electric and magnetic fields to evolve them forward in time. So. <clears throat> For years, people have had this recipe in mind where the basic idea is they thought, let's just write down the three geometry describing my problem at some initial moment in time. And the goal is to try to match to one of these iterative solutions that describes a binary using Newtonian theory plus the post-Newtonian refinements that go into general relativity. Uh, we need to choose a way to sort of select my spatial coordinates, which you can think of as just picking a particular gauge, and then just write code. Now, what happened in practice was people then essentially wept with frustration for about, literally about 30 years. Um, when I finished my 
PhD. Uh, that was right around the time that people had finally written code that could stably evolve a single black hole doing nothing. That was actually really hard. And it's because general relativity is a nonlinear theory. And what ended up happening was a little bit of numerical noise in the calculation would get in there and it would be amplified by nonlinearities in the field equation. And so, you know, it shouldn't do anything, but it does. And that's where making the expressing the difference between coordinate degrees of freedom and physical degrees of freedom really came in. Uh, fortunately, a breakthrough happened, which I believe you'll hear more about in Luciano Rezzola's uh, lectures. Solves the problem, it's been compared with data, and that's why we're here today. So let me just sort of wrap up by one last thing that can be understood relatively simply. The final cycles, if I have uh, these objects come together, they merge. If they leave behind a black hole, the waveform has a fairly universal form. It's a simple damp sinusoid whose decay time and frequency only depend on the mass and the spin of the remnant that's left behind. The reason why this is particularly interesting from both an astrophysical and sort of a foundational physics point of view is related to the no hair theorem of general relativity. The no hair theorem tells us that any axisymmetric time stationary space time that has an event horizon is completely specified by three simple quantities. The space time's mass, its angular momentum, and its charge. Astronomically, charge tends to be unimportant. And so mass and angular momentum should be the only things that characterize the late state of uh, the, a merger that produces a black hole. There's no other parameter that can influence it. The way that this theorem is actually enforced is due to these waves that we call the ring down of the system. So when, two, uh, when a single black hole first forms, it's probably going to be very lumpy. It's not going to be one of these beautiful exact solutions. It's going to be highly distorted. It's going to have a lot of junk all over it. Um, but if that's the case, it will not be a time stationary solution. It will radiate. And the radiation carries away the lumps, driving it to the Kerr solution. And it has this very simple form, where it's going to look like a sum of various amplitudes with an exponential decay and an oscillating sign. This decay time and this frequency can only depend on the mass and spin of that final black hole. In fact, if uh, the longest lived mode is probably the L equals 2, M equals 2 mode, and if that's the case, it's actually there's long literature on this that leads to a decent degree of approximation. This is, by the way, an empirical fit. This does not come from like a detailed, uh, rigorous calculation. You solve these things numerically, and then you fit polynomials to them. Uh, but there's a simple relationship between the mass of that final black hole, the Kerr parameter that describes its spin, and then this quantity Q here is essentially it's a quality factor. It sort of tells us uh, how many times this thing oscillates as it decays away. <coughs> Those is just, that's just one mode. All the modes have a, set, uh, a dependence that kind of looks like this. And this tells us that there is uh, a consistency test for general relativity here if we can measure multiple modes. If all of them um, agree with this sort of formulation, this is an empirical test on the validity of the no hair theorem. Uh, so let me just wrap up by showing you a little bit what this ends up looking like. So here is, if I have a fairly massive binary black hole merger in the wave band of LIGO, I would measure the last several cycles of the in-spiral. I see things plunging and coming together. And these are that final, those final ring down cycles. These things are called ring down because that damp sinusoid, you know, it really looks like mathematically the ringing of a bell. This Q, which describes this thing's, uh, the, the, the amount of time that it rings, the number of cycles it rings on, when you actually uh, look at this for you know, the kind of spins that people are now measuring, the quality factor associated with that, with that oscillator is terrible. Okay? A good bell, you ring a bell, and it'll, there'll be thousands or tens of thousands of oscillations that decays away. You know, it lasts for a while. For a bell, that's a ring. For a black hole, the equivalent number, it's not thousands or tens of thousands, it's like four. So when I turn this into a sound, <laughs> let's do that again. Now, a colleague of mine once said, black holes don't really ring, they thud. <laughs> and so <laughs> it doesn't have the same ring to it, but this is uh, the, the, the thudding that is the outcome of a final black hole collision.
I will stop there, and then in one of my lectures tomorrow, we'll talk a little bit more about how this can be used to learn about the properties of black holes and to test gravity. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> So I believe it's lunchtime, but we should probably take some questions first. <laughs> yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. On effect of F2, M2, does it is included in gravitational wave So let me make sure I understand what you're saying. Are you imagining two neutron stars colliding? In spiraling. In spiraling. OK, so during the in spiral. In spiraling, in spiraling, I can't say. But. Yeah, so if we have two, two, two bodies in spiraling, one of them is a neutron star. You're asking about the, the radiation as it, as it impacts one of the neutron. Let's say it's two neutron stars. Um, and so then the, the radiation. The rotation radiation, it creates effects of effects on. Yes. yes, 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 yes. So it's not explicitly included in what I've discussed, uh, but people do think about that kind of thing. There are several effects that you can imagine in that case. Let me go back to a, a previous slide just to uh, give myself a, a cartoon. Let's see. Here we go. So, ah, there it is. So let's imagine that one of these bodies is a, is a neutron star. At least one of these bodies is a neutron star. And as these guys are orbiting one another, they're producing gravitational radiation. But there are several other effects happening as well. When I did this calculation. I actually imagined that these two bodies were just point masses. And I described this effect of angular momentum coupling as the first correction to the point mass approximation. But there's other effects. If these are, in fact, fluid bodies, then they will be tidally distorted. Okay, So it will feel a tide due to its companion. That will interact with the binary. Um, if the body is tidally distorted and spinning, its individual spin will produce gravitational waves. Okay? And that can also have a, a back reaction on the, on the system. It could, in principle, have an effect. Uh, people have done some calculations where they've imagined, so you can make oscillating modes within the star itself. Okay? So if it's a fluid body, you distort it. Gravity tends to push against those, those oscillations. And so the body can itself begin to oscillate. And there can be a resonance, in some cases, between that fluid mode and the orbital frequency. OK, and so then can you have an interaction with the gravitational wave with this body itself here? Probably, in, well, for a neutron star, not much. OK? Be that's right. That's right. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit in my final lecture about there's an interesting phenomenon that can happen where there is radiation that gets absorbed. So if this body were not a neutron star, but it were a black hole, uh, you can have radiation interact with the black hole. And that has a very interesting back reaction on the orbit um, in that case, essentially due to the interesting physics of the way event horizons uh, operate. If it's a fluid star, there is not a very, there's a small, but not a very important interaction of the radiation with the fluid in that star. And so there is probably, it doesn't so much amplify it as uh, just, a, it, it, it changes the instantaneous interaction uh, of the neutron star with the orbit. At the moment, no. No. And, this, and the fact that that, it doesn't need to be taken into account in order to make the measurement is kind of a, a, a proof by counterexample that you didn't need to. Because if it were important, those templates would have missed the sources. I have another question. Yes. To, to gravitational waves all, always tend to circleize orbit until they merge? <laughs> um, or they will come to a point where 
they become circulating apart. Yes. And examples of will increase. I don't have a slide on this, but let me sketch. I'm going to talk a little bit about this, a little bit more. I still have to finish writing my slide for this. But that's right. That's right. So let me make a sketch for you. Imagine you have a binary that consists of a big black hole with some large angular momentum. And you have a smaller body in orbit around it. Okay, so we call this an extreme mass ratio in spiral. So it's one where the mass of the little body is perhaps 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 6. So this might be, for instance, a 10 solar mass black hole, and this a million solar mass black hole. This is actually the kind of one of the important sources that people are thinking about for space-based detectors. And uh, it's also what I happen to be spending most of my research time on these days. I was grinning while you asked my question because I have a plot that answers your question exactly that was emailed to me by one of my students the day before I got on the plane to come to Turkey. So <laughs> let me describe that, that. So if you imagine uh, binaries like this are created by scattering processes. Okay, So you, the, uh, the smaller black hole starts out in some field of stars, and then through multi-body processes, it winds up on an orbit that is very eccentric. That's the thing that's particularly important about this. And so we're very interested in the answer to your, exactly your question, because we know these enter the band of the detectors with high eccentricity. So let's say this is my eccentricity axis. Let's put one up here. And let's say this is the binary semi-major axis. When it enters, so according to the calculations we're doing quite literally today, <laughs> when it enters the band of the detectors, it might be somewhere up here. And what we find is that it circularizes, it circularizes, it circularizes, and then it stops circularizing and it comes back up. <laughs> so something interesting happens in this case. And a big part of it has to do with the fact that it enters the field, all, it enters the band of detectors already in a very strong field configuration. This statement that the binary is always circularized, let me see if I can find uh, the formula. Yeah. So this idea that it always circularizes, bear in mind this came from kind of a weak field expansion of these things, and there are additional terms when you iterate this to higher order. The analysis that we did of these things is actually exact, but linearized in the mass ratio of the system. Um, and so this starts out in the strong field regime here, and they, you know, it ends up plunging. It sort of enters the point where it falls into the black hole. And the eccentricity, it's smaller, but it's not even close to zero. So you know, at least in some cases, this circularization doesn't hold anymore. And we do believe there will be sources for which they will enter the band and have substantial eccentricity. <laughs> Very good question. Like I said, I mean, this is literally stuff we were working on last week. <laughs> I should emphasize, people have known about this sort of phenomenon kind of in general for a while. Um, this is as part of a particular research program where we're trying to make a family of waveforms in this large mass ratio limit for people to use. has to be at R0, and of course, it, it may be rotating, but it has to have some mass distribution or some kind of inside. So th it, it's... <sighs> It's a mistake to think of the gravity as arising from the singularity. That's, I think, the issue. If you have a black hole like this, You know, what we, what we understand is that we, we, we paint this picture where we give this object a surface, right? But be careful about that. That doesn't mean that that surface tells you everything about the gravitational interaction. And in particular, what you find is that the angular momentum in the space-time is actually distributional. It's actually the space-time itself 
that has the angular momentum. Okay, and quite a lot of the angular momentum is actually distributed in a region that goes outside of the space time. You know, it's not, we have this picture, which we learn in our textbooks, that there's a little point in the center there, it's this little singularity, and maybe it has some kind of a structure associated with it. You know, <laughs> who knows what's going on back there? Perhaps God knows, I sure don't. <laughs> um, perhaps string theory or loop quantum gravity will tell us someday. But what we do know is that there is angular momentum distributed throughout the space time. And that, you know, it, thinking of it as confined to a point and associated with this surface, that is what's misleading. Okay? There's, it's actually distributed. And this is borne out by the fact that if I put an object in orbit around this thing right here, if I get it close enough, it is dragged into co-rotation with this thing because space-time itself is the thing that has this sort of spin associated with angular momentum in it. And so when I have a material object, you know, we all have a good intuition. I have angular momentum, right? I'm spinning around. As I collapse down to a black hole, which I hope I don't do, but imagine I then collapse down to a black hole, I leave a residue of my matter that is spinning on space-time itself. And it's the space-time that is the thing that is dragging around. What's happening inside this thing? I'm not even going to speculate. But I do know that there is a residue that is bound up in the space-time itself. And that is what leads to the effects that we can measure. That means space-time has a material substance somehow, does it? Yes. <laughs> it carries energy. It, uh, according to this, it can have mass. It can have angular momentum. It's not matter, that's right. You have to make a different speech. It, it's not matter, but it has energy and angular momentum associated with it. You know, it's in the same way. You know, radiation, look at this light here, right? It's massless, but it carries energy, it carries angular momentum. Space time itself has similar properties associated with it. They are related in general. And one last question. Do we quantify this? I've never worked out any, I've never seen anything like that really worked out. I mean, the, the closest I would say are these calculations of how much energy comes from the oscillations in space time, you know, that arise from a particular source. You know, because wh what these are coming from are when we measure the piece of it with our detectors, that's an oscillation in space time that we are measuring. Sorry. Uh, I'm very really confused with one of your sentences in the previous lecture in, in this morning. You said we cannot localize gravity into uh, general relativity. So you meant we cannot use any coordinate system, right? What, what I'm saying is that I can always, at a specific point in space and time, I can choose a coordinate system which I think is getting to your question. I can choose a coordinate system such that space-time local to some event has no gravity associated with it. Hmm. So because as far as I understood, by the way, I know that this is an elliptical engineer, so my project type may be kind of amateur. Uh, so as far as I understood, everything depends on the binary separation. Yes. So the short mass and the et cetera, et cetera. So from an observer at this point to that, uh, can I choose a coordinate system on that plane for defining R? You can, but you, you, there's an interesting point you make here, uh, which is that it's not a unique coordinate system. Okay, and so if you choose a different one, you then need to redo the entire analysis, and you always have to be careful to make sure that you formulate uh, the outcome of your analysis in terms of quantities that can be measured. And I claim that if you do that, the quantities that can be measured will be independent of the choices of the coordinate system that you make. So the basic point to, to define a coordinate system is to define, in fact, to define the R, binary separation. That, that's one thing. That's right. On that. That's right. Yes. And like I said, that is non-unique. One can do other ways of it. But I claim that if you do it correctly and self-consistently at every step, the outcomes of what can be measured do not depend on the choices you make. Thank <laughs> you.